strong, empowered, authentic. What's up, Ginger Nation? This is Tosh. This is Darren, and you are listening to the Authentic Ginger Podcast. Hello, Ginger Nation. Welcome to the Authentic Ginger Podcast. I'm Tosh Taylor. And I'm Darren Roach. And on today's show is a nonfiction photographer known for his research-driven photo stories and portraiture. His personal work considers the interplay of environment and culture, tracing global events through daily lives. Welcome to the show, Kieran Dodds. How are you doing? Thank you so much. I'm doing okay. I'm yeah. doing well. I think in Britain we say okay and we mean well. We okay. say not, not bad if you think you're okay. <laughs> so, so you're okay then? Yeah, I'm okay. Which means good in Canada. Yeah. Great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or fantastic, yeah, yeah. if you will. Yeah. Amazing. I feel yeah. great. <laughs> so yeah, I do. I'm happy to be here. Before we talk about like you and growing up as a ginge, what yeah. what does a nonfiction photographer mean? I've never heard that before. Yeah, it's a kind of novel uh, sort of title. Um, I, my background's in photojournalism, and that word itself got problematic. People were just not sure what truth and things. Are is anymore um a non-fiction i came across it with a dutch editor and it's like what's a non-fiction book like we don't have an issue with that in a bookshop we know what it's about it's about things that are real and out there um and so i just thought let's apply that to photography and it works for me because my work is found in editorial like magazines and newspapers but also in books and also in galleries and so i thought it was quite a good way to describe what i do because people often ask you know um, you're a photographer what do you take pictures of like weddings or and I feel like non-fiction is kind of it covers enough bases and is intriguing <laughs> enough or it just shuts down conversation yeah. the first time I used it actually um the, the woman next to me just laughed at me <laughs> this is in Britain they just thought I, was, I, I don't know she thought it was pretentious or unusual and it is unusual so thanks for noticing yeah <laughs> I mean, it sounds really good. So tell us, you, uh, as part of your career, you have created mm. uh, a lot of love around the ginger world, which I think is incredible, as exactly what Darren and I are trying to do as well. Um, so tell us, for you, what was it like growing up with red hair? Yeah. What was it like? It was in, I was obviously in, growing up in Scotland, um, and so it was more common than most of the world. Yeah, it was good, I think. I mean, people, it's the thing people latch on to to insult you. So when I got older, it was something people would call me ginger, something else. Uh, and <laughs> and you kind of get used to that or carrot top. There's not, not the most inventive of nicknames. <laughs> but once you came to terms with that um, and you realized the sun wasn't always your friend and you could hide in the shade and things, life was good, actually. Because my mum was ginger, she's beautiful um, hair. And my granddad, my papa, um, and he was he was ginger till he died. I remember on his deathbed, he had this oh, wow. beautiful glow to him. And as the sunlight, it, it was just glorious. Um, and so like people I I looked up to, like my my role models in life were ginger. Because in the 1980s, like who was ginger and famous? There was not very many, like, I mean, why do we look to famous people for role models for but one it's thing? True. But yeah. Archie? There weren't there were many. Who's that? Archie? Who's, yeah. Archie. From the comics? No Archie comics in Scotland, maybe. Maybe, maybe that's not. a North America thing. Yeah. I missed out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Boris Becker. With Boris Becker. I realized the other day we that's had right. um, Boris Cunningham, Becker, yeah. Cunningham from the Fonz. Is it Cunningham on, on Richie? Happy Days? Yeah, Richie. Yeah. Rich, Richie. Richie yeah. Cunningham. And he he's turned out to be a great film director. Mm -hmm. So that was it. Um, so, I mean, my brother was ginger as well. And there, there was a few of us around. So I, I generally had a good uh, childhood. I'm very happy with that. Um, and it's been, a, I actually spent a bit of time in Canada. Really? Um, which is good. Yeah, Edmonton. In Edmonton. Child. That's actually where I remember taking my first photograph. Yeah, wow. No way. Way. <laughs> and it wasn't a ginger person, it was a raccoon in Edmonton Zoo. Um, <laughs> and it really was that moment. It really was that moment that I had never experienced um, the joy of photography till that moment you know, closing the shutter and then running off to tell my dad. And that that's the kind of instinct. How old was How old were you at that point? I was seven. Seven. Seven years old with a camera in your hand. You take a picture of a raccoon. Yeah. You go and tell your dad, this is what I just did. I, sh I just shut the release on the shutter and, it, and this magical thing happened. Of course, it wasn't digital at that time, right? It wasn't. Was it? I had to describe it with words, yeah. That's right. And he says what? 
I can't remember actually. Oh. He probably, I know. Sorry. So he, he said, "That's beautiful, son." No, he didn't. Yeah. He just. I think he probably said, Stop, "Don't take too many pictures." Yeah, it costs money. Don't that's waste right. the film. Yeah. Don't waste the film. Don't point into the sun. That's what he always says. So this is intriguing. So, so you 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 go home, and at what point do you decide that you're going to uh, get that developed? And and what happens when you develop it and you see that picture for the first time? Yeah, I think I still I've got the photo still. And cool. it's a good, it's actually quite well composed. It's an Instamatic Kodak. Yeah. And so it's square like Instagram and it's it's nicely done. And the raccoon turned to me just at the moment of the shutter going click. And so cool. that for me was like the synthesis of this moment. And uh, I, I just I always remember growing up, taking lots of photographs and just putting it in to get developed. And every time it came back, there was a sense of expectation. And um, you never knew what you were going to get and deflation often but also those moments of joy uh, a photo that works and so i remember that picture it still works for me um but it's that instinct that that kind of carries me in my work it's that feeling of being attracted to something because you find it amazing or because you find it um something you want to tell the world about because it isn't because it needs changed it is wrong um and so that that instinct remains and so when it came to doing the gingers um, the, the photo series, it was that same instinct that was, that was drawing me to it, although I had the personal connection as well, being myself. Mm -hmm. And so then, as you say, you, you grew up pretty, it was pretty light, lightheaded for you. In other words, there wasn't a whole ton of, uh, you know, make fun. I mean, there was make fun, mm. you know, later on, I guess, in your, I guess, junior high school, or did you know that you'd be doing a project like that at that point in time? Um, or something to do with, with it. Because you did mention earlier that you were looking up to other redheads. And, and that's a really interesting point that you brought up. Like, why do we look up to redheads? Well, I, I think it's important. I, I feel like it's important that, that our kids have someone to look up to so that they can see that uh, there is light at the end of the tunnel if they're having some difficulties in, yeah. their, in, you know, in their social circles. Um, yeah. You know, what, 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 if you take us back there for a quick second... What did that mean to you when you were looking for that that Boris Becker in you or, or whoever it was? Like, was it, can you remember what that was like? I suppose so. I mean, I never really reflected on it consciously at the time. I just think I remember if people insulted me, I would think, well, my mom's ginger and she's beautiful. And so is my papa. He's the nicest man on planet Earth. So um, I think for me, that was my frame of reference. And that stopped when the insults came. You just had that kind of, you repelled them because you thought, well, that can't be true because <laughs> because uh, these people are great, um, and I think when I did the the, the portraits to begin with, um, the people who came along, you know, I'd speak to them about what their experience was having the color, whether they even noticed it, how it affected them, and it was a bit like a ginger support group at times, you know, um, and I could relate to it. And for the kids at school, it was nice because their mum would come usually or their dad, and they'd chat to me a bit, and they'd be shy at first, and then we'd get into more chat, and they would often, I get an email from the parent afterwards saying such and such, we, Andrew or whatever, is walking taller now. You know, he's, he feels like he's part of this bigger story. And that, that is what it's about because people have done portraits of gingers before, but I feel like I was doing something different. One, calling it ginger rather than redhead um, for various reasons, but also because I was connecting what seemed like a local trait in Scotland to its global past you know it is a global trait and that was the big idea it's global in art history so you have it in these middle eastern characters and southern european artists paintings in the national gallery of scotland and across the world you know from the medieval times these amazing divine characters with glowing gingery red hair um, but you also have it across the world in terms of the diaspora of scotland but beyond that like in central asia and china of all places so i felt like i was trying to lift the person out of their local context to say you're part of a bigger story you're part of uh, the story of a moving humanity um you just mentioned there you called it ginger for various reasons is that i, mm. I would like to i would like to dig deeper on that <laughs> me too me too <laughs> well yeah i mean it is because ginger um usually comes before an insult uh it can do but I, I used it for its descriptive power i think primarily because i feel like red uh I just saw, I was trying to, I forgot my password um, to get on Zoom and the, the recapture, you know, those little things you have to click. It's like, show us the traffic lights. So it's a fire hydrant um, and it was red, you know, bright red, you know, like, and that's not what the color of my hair is. Blood's red, fire engines are red, you know, so right. I felt like it's not 
Um, it's not red as such. And it's this incredible mix of colors. And I feel like ginger is specific to that spectrum. Um, but also because of the connotations that are generally negative in Scotland, I thought it was quite good because, um, yeah, I, I feel like it redeems the word a bit. It reframes it. Um, and that wasn't my main point, uh, but I am, I'm trying to show the beauty of it. And I feel like Ginger's is also um, kind of a bit light and funny. And you're, you're right about the, the different shades. It's really hard. And we've talked about this before, even in an entire family of gingers, like I bet your mom's red is different from your red and your brother's red. Um, and same with me, my brother and I are very different in like, we're both ginger, but, but he's a, like a very dark auburn, auburn. And I used to be pretty red and it keeps lightening up as I get older, but, but, uh, it is interesting and sometimes you, I think probably, especially you doing the fo the photos, you probably saw colors of ginger that you've never even seen before. Yeah, I never dreamed of. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, yeah, and it goes from that, and it's and people who come along though who are because I, I didn't screen it as such. I mean, people would send a picture, and if I did a social media call out, they'd send a picture and their contact details and things. Um, and then it was you, you kind of you'd see a real range in that. But if people are coming forward saying they are redhead or ginger, then you kind of take them at that. Um, but again, you get that range of tones. And so older people, it would go either very dark brown or very light or white, which I love sometimes, but you'd always have the hint of it. And um, whereas young people, it's all it's just like fire, you know, it's yeah. the brightest at the stage in your life when you want it to be the least bright. Um, and then it, yeah, it fades right. over time when you're desperate to cling on to it, you know. Um, yeah, you why be, can't why can't that happen when you're young? That, why that is funny, right? Yeah. Yeah, you should have, if we take Tasha's example of her hair getting lighter as she's aging, why shouldn't it have been the opposite? Give you the light hair starting out and then make it nice, bright, fiery red into your 30s when Wouldn't you can actually, you have a voice, you know how to, to take anything. It's like perfect. Yeah, red hair is wasted on youth. That's what they say, isn't it? Yeah. Oh my God, I love that. Yeah. <laughs> I think everyone we've interviewed has said that. Like, I wish I knew when I was a kid how great it was. Yeah. Like, yeah, and we never did. Has yours lightened up a lot? Because you look like you're really fair, like a really fair ginger. Yeah, it used to be. It used to be fiery. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's stress. I mean, two years ago, before the pandemic, all these policies they've just turned me. There's more silver now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, Ginger Nation? If you're looking for authentic ginger swag, go to www.authenticginger.com. Use code AG Podcast for 20% off your next purchase. Talking about the book um, that you call a, 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 The Little Book of Gingers. Yes. Uh, so that's the, that's the, the uh, photo, would it, be the, would it be a photojournalistic approach? Is that what you would call it? Like what, what would you call the book as you know, yeah. the subtitle? Little Book of Gingers featuring. Yeah, so it's, it's uh, Global Portraits of Gingers. Yeah. Um, and The Little Book of Gingers is, a, so I had the Gingers book, which came out in 2020. That was the sort of collection from across the world, from Jamaica to Russia, and with all these links in between. And that that was um, during the pandemic, November, everyone was miserable. And uh, it, it sold, like the first edition was a limited edition and it just disappeared before it came out. So I was amazed wow. at that. And I produced a paperback version um, in time for Christmas. And that's, there's a, there's a not, not many of them left, but there's some of them. And I thought going forward, I want to continue this project and do it. I've got a plan for elsewhere and I've got um, some visas lined up uh, for the next stage. I've been waiting for ages to do the next one. But cool. I thought in the meantime, actually, there's, there's people in the world who um, like photo books. And so I produced a smaller version that's compact. It ships for less as well, which is good. Um, and it's, it's a kind of condensed, abridged version of, of the originals. But it's got all the, the connections across the world. So it's, it's, it's portraits of... Um, a typology, if you want a technical term, uh, gingers of the world. It's a little, it's, it's little, so it means it's pocket size. You can carry it to the shops and just think, oh, look, there's a, someone from Russia. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why I did it. I just, and it's, it's, I love, I'm a bit addicted to making books as well. So that's thought, cool. <laughs> let's make something as well for kids, like the kids who came in it might not want to spend 20 quid on a photo book, though some of the parents have. Whereas this is like, I just want them to look through this and think like we're talking about earlier, they're in all seriousness. So they look through and think, you know, I'm part of this amazing global family. I think it's really cool. Cause I, uh, I have a blonde daughter and a strawberry blonde and my blonde daughter is 
far more interested in gingers than, oh. I mean, she's also older um, than her sister, but, but she would love that. Like she would adore mm-hmm. just looking through that book. Like every redhead book I have, she probably knows more redhead facts than I do. And, mm-hmm. and she's yep. a blonde. So <laughs> she just, yeah. I, I think, um, I think me doing this podcast too, and, and being proud of my hair and she has very, very curly hair. So she is very like hair positive. So it doesn't really matter for her <laughs> what the color is, but yeah. I, I agree. Yeah. Like, I think the kids in that book, but also other kids would be like, this is so cool to look at all these other kids mm. from around the world who mm. you wouldn't realize what like is Jamaica redheads in Jamaica, yeah. you know, nobody's yep. thinking that. Yeah. 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 Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And a lot of them, even though what Jamaican ones, like what, what I liked was in Russia. So it's it, like hours across from Moscow in the city of Perm. Uh, you've got people with Asian surnames. And then in Jamaica as well, Wong, you know, there's this big Chinese uh, immigration to Jamaica. So I thought you basically encircled the world because you've got these <laughs> surnames and connections. Yep. It's, it's, it's just that amazing mix of humanity. Which is relatively why they would say, you know, the redhead gene is every single place in the world. Mm. I mean, yeah, you know, and 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 w- the research that I've done before we started the, the authentic ginger clothing business, obviously, was where did it come from, you know, where what mm. country did it originate from that that you can go back. And in Asia is the only answer I can come up with yeah. as to where red hair actually kind of was first documented or or at least uh mm-hmm. seen in, in in color um but yeah it's it's super interesting stuff and you know the fact that you're traveling the world photographing uh redheads um you know in its in and itself I, the question i have is is how did you contact these people and or did they contact you once something was out like how did it all come together mm. yeah so in scotland to begin with i um just put bo- word out to friends friends and family in the underground ginger network and got people along yeah. for that <laughs> and then they came along and then they uh, i put those pictures online and i was amazed at the response like most of my work is environmental photography so mm-hmm. landscapes and people in the landscape and portraiture and things um and so this was a bit of a um not not a total tangent because it does link into this idea of maps and and distribution of people within in the landscape and the world um so there were connections in the genetic legacy so that it, it links to my past in zoology at university and things um but it, it started so yeah i put the pictures out there on my website or on facebook and people would share it and they get in touch and then i'd say oh this date i can i'll be in edinburgh um and people would get in touch and i would just have to filter through and see who i could manage in a day and mm-hmm. um, so I'd have like a half hour slot. People come in, have a chat, do a portrait. And yep. um, I did I did the Redhead Day, Redhead Day UK in London. Oh, and yeah. I, did, I didn't book that. I didn't make slots for people. I just said, you know, turn up. And it was just a queue. It's just a, and it's not the way to work, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, met, I met some great people there. But there was just, it was amazing. I just couldn't believe it, this queue of people. Um, yeah. And then in Russia, um, Again, I got a local fixer, somebody to help organize. And he he didn't think it was, <laughs> he was, he was happy to do the work, but I mean, he just didn't think it'd be something. And he got hundreds of people get in touch on VK, which is like Facebook, they rip off of Facebook. Um, and Not then anymore. in Jamaica, in Jamaica, <laughs> it was uh, the local, again, a local uh, per- person to f- do the fi- fixing and connecting. And so again, a small local community in Treasure Beach, everyone knew each other and so she was able to meet people and say are you up for this and it was fewer people obviously because it's rarer um, but right. we got a good spread of um ages and some great portraits um including one which now in the scottish um the national gallery of um the national portrait gallery in scotland has just acquired uh, four prints and three of them are on display just now it just opened up as part of a, a show in the census so one of them is jamaican uh, there's two Scots, and there's also one um, Israeli guy who's in, who's going to appear later in another gallery. Super cool. You're having a conversation with them before you photograph them. So curious to know if mm. there's a general, if there's a, 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 um, the same kind of a message that is said to you that you say to other people. Like, you know, uh, Tosh talks about it many times on the podcast where you see another redhead, you, you look at them, you know them, you go, yeah. I know exactly it's what you're thing. all about, where yeah. you've been, right? <laughs> so do, did you have that connection with uh, with these folks as well? Maybe not necessarily the younger kids, but there could have been something different. But with mm-hmm. someone, say, of, of your peered age, um, is it 
was it that was that connection there? I think so. Yeah, I got on with them. I got on with the people. And then even in countries where it wasn't the first language, like Russia, for example, there was still that kind of um, smile, you know, because you share this right. amazing trait and you've, you've kind of, there's similar, when they speak about the experience, there are similarities, like you said earlier, it's the arc of, you know, it's, it's admired when you're very young and you kind of, you like it and grannies admire it. And then you get older and it's like, it's the thing people latch onto to attack you. And then, then you grow to love it. Um, and the cultural links as well in these countries, there, there's often positive and negative connotations. It's, it's seen as divine or devilish. You know, you've got these um, the, the kind of beauty of it, the marvel of it, also attracts the the haters. So that is similar everywhere. The only place it didn't seem to be the same was Jamaica, funnily enough, um, where again it's a country of of so many different traits and backgrounds and and um, identities that it wasn't something at least the the people i spoke to didn't seem to think it was they didn't even think about it that much which seems amazing hmm. um and they hadn't been bullied for it particularly hmm. no one had really noticed i thought that was interesting whereas everywhere else especially in scotland i think it's really hated on in scotland you know because it's common enough to be uh it's scottish um yeah. but generally <laughs> in scotland and and britain it's it seemed as quite uh it's, it's quite derogatory really I mean, for blokes anyway, you're kind of um, you're seen as some idiot or some weakling, whereas for women it's almost hypersexualized. So it's this kind of strange, strange thing going on um, in its in its homeland. But you got to travel all over the world doing this, which uh, way to go! Sm- fantastic business move on your behalf. <laughs> that's that's amazing. Yep. Someone's got to go there, you know. Someone, I mean, someone has to do it. Yeah, for the sake so, of truth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so when you were deciding to do this project, like mm. how did you pick which countries you were going to go to? It started in Scotland before the independence referendum. So it was going to just stay in Scotland because I thought it's a cliche of national identity. And I thought in a year's time, they were going to vote on whether Scotland should be independent. So I chose, I chose these stories about Scottish identity. And then I sort of did it and I was amazed at the reaction. And so then I did this sort of London based one and London, I met lots of people from around the world. And so that kind of expanded it further, but really at the start, I'd seen a map um, when I was looking at the ginger gene and you've probably seen these maps too, because the ginger gene was discovered in Edinburgh. And so we've got a claim on it. Um, but the scientist who, who, uh, who, who found that also was doing research because he's a, a dermatology uh, was he's retired um, professor. So he had done research in Jamaica on melanoma, like skin cancer. And so from the start, I thought, right, I need to get to Jamaica. And then when I was doing the other research online, I found these terrible, dubious maps, which had like red hair distribution, you know, yeah, not, yeah. not based on any signs, particularly no. <laughs> like haploid groups and things. It just felt like it was make belief, but they were very, very confident maps saying there's a, a hot spot in Russia, you know, so yep. you've got the Celtic fringe, Scotland, Ireland, Wales. Um, and then you've got like, Russia. So from the start, I thought, well, here's my polls. You know, I want to go Caribbean and Russia. And it took years, you know, just you progress these personal projects as and when funding or the opportunity comes and you do other work in the meantime. Um, and so that's just how it's progressed. And I've got I've got plans to go. There's three other installments I'd like to do, but it might take another decade, you know, mm. before things happen. And that's partly why I do the books, because that helps me um, sort of justify the time to to research and, and make the connections but i've got the, the the next chapter i really want to do in the next year um so i'm not going to say where yeah but um it sounds like it, canada to me yeah <laughs> that's right well canada would be good actually but no it's not actually i might i might oh. tr- we'll see we we're talking about all the different colors different shades of red mm. there's no two people that have the same kind of freckles <laughs> like, yeah 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 it's unique isn't it and yeah. i actually yeah. tended to find i'd photograph people uh, just after winter as well and i quite liked the kind of really pale smooth skin because you know it's a season that often pops out and mm-hmm. the sun appears and the, but there was one lad in inverness i remember oh there's two lads actually they're brothers and their great granddad was from India because I'd just noticed their, their, their freckles are really, really like prominent and mm-hmm. beautiful. And I said, you know, it's amazing. You know, what's the kind of tell me about your family? And he said that, that about the, the sort of India, India connection. And I thought that's incredible. You know, so the pigment comes through. Um, it tells a story in itself, you know, well, which, which, it's gone. Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah. that's pretty cool. And I would assume 
that uh, in Jamaica, in India, obviously, it, those are regions of full on sun, mm. full on summer. Yeah. You know, Toss, do your freckles come out in the summer? Oh, yeah. I will look like a totally different person come June. Yeah. 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 It's amazing, isn't it? The difference. Yeah. I find that too. If I could find a safe way to keep my freckles all all year round, I would. But I mean, tanning beds right. the only way that's going to happen, and that's <laughs> I'm just, I don't yeah. feel like it's just not worth it. It's just yeah, like... yeah. I don't think so. I don't think so because there's a bit of skin damage, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> but it's beautiful skin damage. I mean, it's that's it's right. Thing. Um. So I, I just uh, I'm I'm a bit of a camera geek. Um. So I, I just want to slide this in there. What kind of gear do you use? Or oh, what typewriter did Hemingway use? I'm not Hemingway, but yeah. I would say um, and anyway, the the cameras, it was generally just as Canon I use. Yep. Okay. Um, I think it was starting off with a 5D Mark II then the three, and mm-hmm. then now on to the R5. Um, so, and, but mainly just using that with one lens. I'm very simple um, as a person, so I try and keep it simple. And so I used like a 135 F2 lens which is a lovely portrait lens and just get that yeah. distance and shortening and things. Sometimes I use a 50 mil. 50 mil, yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah, and lighting. So I just got one one continuous light with a octa- octagonal diffuser. Yes. Um, and then I used a, a sort of small reflector. I just kept it simple, like I say, because in a way it was a discipline for me to work on my portraiture and it's getting people who aren't models to come in and that kind of belief. Yep that everybody has this kind of intrinsic worth and beauty in them. And so it's using one light to try and, you know, capture um, who they are and what they're like, um, kind of was good for that. You know, it meant, it meant you're focused on actually looking and observing right. rather than thinking about having 17 lights around them and yeah. <laughs> like whatever, shooting a thousand frames. So that, that was a setup. And then recently I've used a sort of a panel as well. So I've had like the main light and a sort of side light sometimes, yeah. but not always. But the main and that's just for shading, stunning. right? Like you're not you're not using light to alter the perception of the imagery that you're photographing, um, mm-hmm. because obviously there's many ways you could you know Tasha's hair. You could, we could make Tasha's hair look fiery in two seconds. Yeah. Um, so obviously the authenticity would have been would have been um, in your forefront of thought. Yeah. Um, to keep that. So yeah, and the, the thing is, though, the same person, like you say, you could have somebody's whose hair is very. It becomes very flat in the wrong light wrong light but if you bring the light forward you see it you know it's it's glory and it just depended on the person and the interview and discussion which would you know, like change the way you think about how you're going to take that portrait um so yeah i think it's it's um yeah it's quite hard to photograph actually yeah i bet <laughs> <laughs> especially when people are models you know you see some beautiful portraits of ginger people and it's often just um, people who you think are very photogenic and actually not everyone is um, right if you, if you just take a quick picture you know what I mean um, so you've got to, you've got to kind of work with them and, and well maybe allow their beauty to flourish how how did it go about getting these photos in the gallery like that must have been like yeah. to you yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and it's, it's it's my favorite gallery growing up I used to come through dad on a Sunday and we'd go to the the Scottish National Portrait Gallery on Queen Street in Edinburgh and now it's I can cycle to it in 15 minutes, but it was just yeah it was it was a slow process to get into national collection, and again surprising like I just feel like it's it's yeah I'm I'm really delighted and surprised. But I think I met up with a curator there just to sort of show them the work so far, and they said you know what else are you can add to it and what what do you want to do and um and just had a, a discussion and they just kept in touch and we kept looking at the work. Um, and then it happened to be they're doing this show on the census. So like it's called Counted. So it's about the census in Scotland um, and Scottish identity. And there's a variety of different works, but they actually chose the paint for the show. If you look at it online, it's like it, it's actually called Ginger Locks, the paint. I think it's uh, Craig and Rose is the, the hmm. paint makers in Scotland and Craig and Rose Ginger Locks. It's like an orange you come into this gallery and it's like some black and white work there's different people but actually they've chosen that and you, you get to the end of it and it's amazing you've got these three big portraits of the, the gingers right at the end so so i'm proud i'm proud of that yeah you should be you should be that's a, absolutely. absolutely amazing um so i think what i've taken away from this conversation today before we let you go is there really we have your entire life to thank 
one <laughs> raccoon in Edmonton. Yep. Edmonton Zoo. Yeah. yeah. If Edmonton Zoo are listening, I'd love to come back and thank you in person. I don't understand why they had a raccoon in the zoo, but <laughs> that, is, <laughs> that is another I know, question. I know. It's funny, isn't it? It's a bit desperate. They had camels bit, and things as well. It's a bit but... desperate. Yeah. <laughs> I remember yeah. it fondly. And it was a time when West Edmonton Mall was quite good, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Since it's gone downhill, I saw some video security guards there, but we had a great time in Edmonton. I loved Edmonton. I'd love to go back. Well, I think you definitely should, because I am sure that you can find your fair share of raccoons and redheads. But I was yeah, like, great. when you said your first shot was in Edmonton, my I immediately think mountains, not right. yeah. a raccoon yeah. in a zoo. We did the mountains as well, yeah. We went on a train journey through to Vancouver. Oh, cool. And I think that's, do you know, I think that's where I got my love of travel. I think it was, honestly, that trip. Because I was seven, and I had my little safari suit. I looked really yeah. sharp. <laughs> and I had a little camera. And honestly, I don't think I've changed. Yeah. <laughs> well, Doesn't appear so. <laughs> thank you, Canada. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Canada. Yeah, yeah. exactly. I'm so, I'm so grateful. I, I owe everything to Alberta. There you go. <laughs> That's incredible. I just, I, I really love what you're doing and I hope that you keep putting out additions and chapters and, and I'm just okay. going to keep an eye on you and keep watching what you're doing. Cause I think it's super cool. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for doing what you do. Yeah, you're welcome. And you're before welcome. we let you go, I do want to yeah. know your socials and how people can get in touch with you. Okay. Um, so Kieran Dodds, K I E R A N D O D D S. Uh, for most things, for Twitter, uh, for Instagrams, probably where you get my photos most. Yeah. And then email on my website as well, kierandodds.com. You'll see the gingers there. You see uh, merch and uh, books and things. And um, it doesn't actually, I've not got a distributor in North America. So I'm, I'm, I'll, I'd am I'm, like that. But it's yes. on Amazon as well. So maybe they'll they'll have it um, uh, over there. Um, but my website as well. And my email's there. You can get in touch. So awesome. Uh, lovely to hear from people. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. Thank you for coming on, uh, Kieran. Uh, and folks, you've been listening to the Authentic Ginger Podcast, and we will see you again next Tuesday. You've been listening to the Authentic Ginger Podcast. Become a part of the Ginger Nation by liking, subscribing, following, and leaving a review wherever you listen to podcasts. This podcast was produced by Tosh Taylor of the Podcast Hub Productions. Find her online at podcasthub.ca.